the biggest obstacle in this profession is prevalence of the word no. When you hear it enough, you have to decide whether or not it's worth it to keep going. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. I am your host, Dr. Weta L. Brown. I inspire and promote movement. I explain how running adds to life from a mental wholeness aspect, how obstacles can be overcome in life to make it to your finish line. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast, episode 46. Today, I have a very special episode. I am so excited. This is pre-recorded, and I am getting ready for Florida A&M's homecoming. And you guessed it, my guest is also a rattler. Kelsey Scott, my line sister, we pledge Delta, Fall 93, is my guest. I wanted to release this episode around the premiere of Insecure. She plays Alicia, who was another attorney who works with Molly at the law firm. Part of my podcast is to feature guests who've overcome obstacles to make it to their finish line. And Kelsey has done just that. As an aside, during the height of the pandemic, she married the love of her life. And I was fortunate enough to meet her husband and her bonus son when I was in LA for my birthday this past August. As another aside, if you don't watch Insecure, you're missing out. The premiere got me as soon as I heard my favorite song, Too Short, Blow the Whistle. If you ever want to see me run to the dance floor, play that song. That is my forever song. Let me tell you a little bit about Kelsey. Kelsey Scott, again, is a proud graduate of Florida A&M University, which sits at the highest of seven hills. She is a two-time Emmy-nominated actress and screenwriter. She began her career in the theater scene of her hometown of Atlanta, Georgia, best known for her role as Anne Northup in the Oscar-winning 12 Years a Slave and her two-season arc as Wes Gibbons' mother, Rose, on How to Get Away with Murder. Her credits also include Insecure, as I mentioned earlier, NCIS, Dynasty, True Detective. She is a 2019 Daytime Emmy nominee for a guest star role on Giants. And in 2017, she received a Primetime Emmy nomination for her leading role on Fear the Walking Dead Passage. As a public speaker, she has shared platforms with other accomplished individuals such as Oprah Winfrey, Jesse Jackson, and the late Maya Angelou, and the late great Shirley Chisholm. It is a pleasure to welcome my line sister, Kelsey Scott, to the show. Well, welcome again. Thank you. So let's start. How did you begin your acting career? I started really young, actually. I started public speaking before acting. My grandmother was a writer, and when she moved in with us after my grandfather passed away, she would write poetry and prose and inspirational speeches, and I would memorize her pieces and go out into the community and recite them for, well, it started small, community gatherings, church. And over time, they escalated to stages with people like Jesse Jackson and Oprah Winfrey and, uh, and Shirley Chisholm. And so I was doing that kind of up until the point where I actually started acting. So I think maybe my first role was around six. I started in Atlanta in the theater scene and just I started and loved it. I could never get enough of it. So I think it began with just being, well, probably it began with just being a ham. You can, <laughs> my mother would say that. <laughs> and that progressed to public speaking and then to acting. So your desire came from the, the public speaking. You, you love that so much and that kind of branched into acting. I think I just was drawn to performing. And the first avenue for me was public speaking. 
And then somebody handed me a script and it was a whole different ball game because then I could become a character. I could become anything I wanted to. Um, so that was the appeal, the professional make believe. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your first role? Do you remember? Wow. That is a tough one. The first role that I actually remember was playing Alice in the best Christmas pageant ever at the Alliance Theater. I can't remember what grade I was in. That was probably the first professional role. I had done things before then, but that was the first time, you know, officially being an actress. So, yeah, that was sometime in elementary school. So what was your first television role? My first uh, nationally televised role was the Robert Guillaume show, which was an ABC sitcom starring Robert Guillaume, <laughs> uh, famous for his role as Benson, and then uh, later in life, probably most known as being the voice of Rafiki and Lion King. But yeah, I did that when I was in, uh, in high school, and uh, it was amazing, because it was a big leap for me, because I had been acting locally, and what happened was my mom saw an ad in the newspaper for this competition and the prize for the competition was they were going to pick kids from 36 states. They came into the competition, did some kind of talent and then read off of the cue card. And based on that, they were going to pick four kids to host some family time programming. So they flew us all up to New York mm -hmm. and we taped these segments and that's where I met my agent. And so suddenly I went from doing local theater to being on an ABC sitcom. So the entire experience was was new and exciting and thrilling, and I was definitely hooked in. So tell me about, I remember you posting this about the picture that your mother, she went in and ran off and when you booked your first agent, the story behind that. Oh, right. So <laughs> they flew us all to New York for this competition, and one of the judges for the competition was um, an agent, a, a children's agent, mostly for kids on Broadway. And so she invited me and mom to come and meet with her at her office once we'd finished taping the segments. And she and mom had a conversation. They shook hands. And all of a sudden, I had an agent in New York. And so she asked mom, she said, well, do you have a picture of Kelsey in your wallet? And so mom found, you know, some little shot of me. And she said, great, take this down the street to this printer, get me 50 copies, bring them back. And that was my first headshot. So mm -hmm. that handshake was the first contract. And that picture from my mom's wallet was my first headshot. And that's how I started my uh, my career in television. So was it a big leap to go from theater to television? Was it a big difference? It probably was. I was young enough and maybe naive enough in the industry that I didn't really clock that at the time. I just did what I had been doing in Atlanta in front of a camera. And I learned, you know, I'm uh, I'm on the set with people who had been doing a lot doing it a lot longer than I had. So, I learned some some methodologies and I learned some tips and some tricks and oh, okay, I can bring this down. It doesn't have to be quite as big as because the camera emphasizes everything. And so, I kind of did some on the job training for that. So, I'm glad I didn't know that perhaps I should have been intimidated because I was able okay. to just have fun, you know. Oh, well, good, good. Did you go to performance high school? I did. I went to a performing arts high school, uh, the DeKalb Center for the Performing Arts at Avondale High School, AHS Forever. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we consider ourselves the mini fame. I mean, we weren't dancing on tables and such, but okay. <laughs> we, had a, we had a good time. And then you went to Florida a and which is where we met. Absolutely. Yes. I majored in broadcast journalism, minored in theater. Also, probably majored in extracurricular because <laughs> I was doing everything all the time. I enjoy a creative outlet. Tell me about your role in Chocolate City. Tell me about your role in the movie. Well, for those who are unfamiliar kind of with the story of Chocolate City, uh, Rob Hardy and Will Packer were students at FAMU and they decided that they wanted to make a film. And they, over an amount of time, got together the financing uh, were able to solicit the kind of behind the scenes work of some of the students at Florida State who were in film school. And so they were making a movie on campus. And at the time, I actually had been producing a television show with my uh, my freshman sister, Nicole Collier, uh, now my soul. And um, we were putting together a television show for FAMU called, uh, called Snake Eyes, which was kind of like this infotainment format. So when Rob and Will were putting the film together, 
someone said to them, oh, you know what, you should meet Kelsey and Nicole because they're doing this television show. And there's I'm sure there's something that you all can talk about and help each other out since you're doing this movie. So uh, Rob invited me to come down to where they were holding callbacks so that we could just have a discussion. So I was there and kind of watching some of the people who were doing their audition. And I said, well, by the way, I don't know if you know, but I'm also an actress. And he said, oh, OK, well, you know, why don't you grab that script over there and, and read these lines that these people are doing for the callback? And I did. And uh, and then ended up <laughs> being cast in the film. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that was that was a bit of synchronicity there. And uh, and Rob and Will and I worked together for many, many, many years. I mean, we still do at certain points. Um, long past FAMU uh, collaborated in, in creative ways. It was fun. If I think about FAMU and even when I see some of the movies now on the big screen when they have the FAMU cameos, it makes me think about my good college days. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. So after leaving FAMU, you went to Florida State for yes. um, graduate school. Tell me yes. about your experience there. I went to get my um, my master's of fine arts in uh, in film. And at Florida State, unlike some other film schools, you don't kind of choose a lane. Like you can't go for directing or for producing or for screenwriting. They teach you everything. So it made me a very well-rounded filmmaker. For instance, I was a writer before that, but I had never written for the screen. So I learned how to do that at Florida State, which is now one of my, you know, I'm a hyphenate. And that's <laughs> that's one of the professions on my hyphenate screenwriter. And um, uh, the curriculum was challenging and straight through six semesters straight, you know, no breaks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, and it was great. And I have lifelong professional and personal relationships from there. And I eventually came back, was invited back to be a visiting filmmaker in residence and taught screenwriting there on both the BFA and the MFA levels. So it was definitely an experience that I'm grateful for. So what do you enjoy the most, acting or screenwriting, or would you say they're about equal? Acting is my favorite child. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely enjoy creating characters and, and, and creating worlds, which is what you get to do as a screenwriter. Um, but if you forced me to choose between my children, it would be acting. <laughs> so what is, uh, I guess, your favorite or your, your best work as far as screenwriting? Oh, wow. As far as screenwriting, that is an interesting question. I never really thought about what my favorite was. You know, I think maybe, <laughs> I think maybe my favorite had nothing to do with what got produced, mm -hmm. uh, that what I'm honestly, what I'm even working on right now. I think the favorite screenplay that I wrote was the one that forced me to do something different in my career. Okay. So after I graduated from Florida State, I moved out to LA and I was doing the, you know, the pay your rent job. Now the pay your mm -hmm. rent job was good because I was working at a studio. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't outside of the industry, but mm -hmm. uh, I was working as a, a, as an executive assistant to, to uh, studio executives and things were going fine. I mean, I'm making a nice check and I was cashing it every week and, but it also took up a lot of time. And at some point, I felt like I wasn't focusing on the career that I had moved to the West to pursue. I mean, it cost a lot to live out there. I was like, if I'm going to pay this much money, <laughs> I'm at the very mm -hmm. least going to be pursuing what I came out here to do. And so I had a screenplay that I had started writing when I was at Florida State and had not finished it. And I decided one day that it was important for me to finish that screenplay, very important, actually. And so I actually went into work one day and said to my boss, look, I have the screenplay and I need to finish it. And I don't know that I can do that coming into work every day. And so I would like to take a leave of absence. <laughs> I think I've been at the job like eight months. Okay. <laughs> but I, said, I would like to take a leave of absence so six weeks and finish my screenplay. And my boss, who is my friend to this day, 
was amazingly and beautifully accommodating and said, you know what, if you can find me someone to sit at your desk for six weeks, you can take that break and finish your screenplay. And so I okay. found a friend who needed a found gig. somebody. I did. I did. She needed a gig. I was like, listen, I got six weeks for you. But don't take my <laughs> job. Like six right. weeks is that's, it. That's right. <laughs> exactly. And so I, uh, I went off and I finished the screenplay uh, just before I was supposed to return to work. And then I came back into work that day and I realized that's not where I was supposed to be. And so I gave 30 days notice and at that same day. And two weeks later, I got a call from a producer asking me for a writing sample because they were looking for a writer for a movie. And I handed, I handed him the script I had just finished. And it had that call come and I had not taken that six weeks, I would have had nothing to hand over because that was the beginning of my screenwriting career, that job. So I think in retrospect, that has to be my favorite screenplay because it changed the trajectory of my career. Divine intervention. Absolutely. It's amazing. Tell me about when you played on uh, 12 Years a Slave, like mm-hmm. your role, and was it a difficult role? It was challenging. Yes. Yeah, so I played Ann Northup, uh, who was Solomon Northup's wife. And well, first it was just exciting. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. exciting to be a part of that project to, to be around that caliber of filmmakers and actors. And so it was, it was a beautiful experience. It was challenging for a couple of reasons. On the performance front, there is not a lot of information about Anne in history, not even in Solomon's autobiography. Mm-hmm. So I needed to fill in the story blanks about her life and perhaps where she was emotionally and psychologically with essentially her husband just disappearing for 12 years. I mean, what does that look like? What does that translate to? Mm-hmm. How do you raise your family? So it was a nice professional challenge in finding her and shaping her and sculpting her without a lot of real world information to work with. How do you do that? You know, it's 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 kind of part and parcel of the gig. I mean, this is a different scenario because I was working with a real life person. But when I'm working with a character that is completely mm-hmm. fictitious, that's what you have to do. You you get what's on the page in terms of a plot, but mm-hmm. you have to flesh them out so that they're three dimensional. You don't want to just, you know, recite lines and say, okay, well, this is what I was supposed to say in this moment. You have mm-hmm. to go back and do some character work and be like, why did she say that in that moment? That's what's going to make the scene or the project rich, your, your work that isn't given to you on the page. So in this scenario, I had to do that same thing, but be conscious that this was a living, breathing human being and really kind of feed into who she was outside of the little bit of information that I had. On a personal level, I shot 12 Years a Slave a year after my mother passed, and I was very much grieving. It was, Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I mean, you know, it's a club that you never want anybody to join you in, but we all get there at some point. And so there are a lot of emotional challenges in pulling everything together and doing what I needed to do and asking for her help, you know, talking to her and, uh, and asking her to imbue me with, with some bravery, (laughs) with some Mm -hmm. fortitude. And Mm -hmm. so all of that kind of came together in that same project. Do you use like the, that emotion that when you were grieving kind of to put into that role? Mm-hmm. I definitely had to. And in this situation, it was actually even more difficult because for those of you who've seen the movie at the end, there's, you know, this kind of tearful reunion. And I was not yet allowing myself the level of, um, abandon with my grief that was healthy. So I was locked up. So tears weren't coming. They, you know, I was trying to, you know, that stiff upper upper lip and that, you know, that that straight spine and I can handle it. And so this part required something different. So even though in in my world, in my day to day, I had the luxury of being stoic. I didn't have that luxury for this character. And those were the moments that I talked to my mother in my trailer before I went on set. I was like, mommy, Mm -hmm. I need to cry. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need to, I need to give over to Anne. So will you help me Mm -hmm. do what I need to do in, in, in honor of this profession that I've chosen? So yeah, it was a, it was a challenge. You did a wonderful job. I remember seeing in the theater, seeing you 
<laughs> and, and then seeing your name in the credits and I was screaming and my friends were looking at me like I was crazy. I'm like, this is my line. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you. So tell me about other roles that you play. I know you've been on the house, Grey's mm-hmm. Anatomy, but mm-hmm. and How to Get Away with Murder, which I, I love the show. At. But I actually took a hiatus and then I found you on it. I'm like, I gotta watch. So <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate. I gotta, I gotta watch. I gotta watch. But you did a, you did a great job of, of roles. Tell me about some of those roles and just ha- working with Viola Davis and Cicely Tyson before she had passed away, and how about that experience? I have been really fortunate to work with some really heavy hitters in the industry. On House, I worked with James Earl Jones. On True Detective, I was able to work with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson. Melissa Leo for Treme and of course Viola Davis for How to Get Away with Murder. I didn't have any scenes with uh, with Miss Cicely Tyson. So, okay. Um, yeah, her her character came on a little later than mine, but of course I am as professionally and personally enamored with her as 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 is appropriate for the impact that she had on the industry. But um, yes, working with Viola was it was beautiful. You know, and it's also really nice when you admire someone from afar, uh, both professionally and just kind of, you know, what it is that they put out in, into the world of their personal selves. And then you meet them and they live up to or exceed your expectations. And so what was just great about working with her was one learning, you know, I'm used to on the job training. Like I said, when I, <laughs> when I got that first television show, I didn't know a whole lot about television. So I try to be a sponge in every situation. So I was grateful to be able to be a sponge around her and people who are at the top of their game, they challenge you to up your game. And so mm-hmm. all of that was a great experience. And then she's just a good person. She's just cool. It seems like. Yeah. Far, and she's good. You know? and so that made it, that made it even better. You know, you, you, you like to find out that the people that you, that you think you like, you actually can like. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Season three, we will continue the new segment called As the Dub. If you have any questions related to musculoskeletal injuries or musculoskeletal health, go to my website, www.weouilife.com, click on the tab voicemail, leave your voicemail, and select messages will be aired and answered on the segment. Now, back to the show. Um, I know you can't spill the tea, I should say, about Insecure, but I, I know you're <laughs> Fel- you play Felicia, a lawyer. You work with Molly. Tell me about that experience. It's one of my favorite shows. I, I watch every episode at least three times. And then I listen to oh. a, a, a podcast <laughs> on it. I think it's called Insecurity. Uh, Insecurity. <laughs> So I like, I like just my, my second favorite show. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm curious about the first, but okay. I'm just, we'll go with it. That's been a lot of fun. The other thing is second to meeting someone, uh, a professional that you have admired and, and ending up kind of bonding with them is being able to be on a show that you watch. So mm-hmm. I was a fan of Insecure. So it was a fun thing to be able to, you know, walk on set and be a part of the magic. And, uh, and it still is. And I love seeing so many people of color behind the camera, uh, on camera and behind the camera. You know, I love that. Listen, one of my favorite, um, experiences was the first episode that I shot and I met Issa in the makeup trailer and then she did her scene and then she changed clothes and she was behind the camera running things. And I was like, now see, I like that. <laughs> the idea that you know, she had that creative control and that she, you know, switched modes with, with a costume change. That's, that's inspiring because I work both in front of and behind the camera. So to see someone doing it at that level uh, is motivational. So oh, no hints on, on hints on anything else. Like what's going to happen? Not a bit. Nope. All right. it. Nope. <laughs> nope. Sorry. Hey, Molly. <laughs> okay. Mm. All right. We just got to stay You'll tuned. You'll see soon enough. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> So part of my podcast is to have guests who have overcome obstacles to make it to their finish line. Can you tell me about some obstacles 
you've had, and you mentioned some of them, um, personal and professional and how you overcame? I think probably the the biggest obstacle in this profession is prevalence of the word no. Mm -hmm. You'll hear it a lot more than you will hear yes. And in the beginning, it might not break the skin. But after years and years of it, it might it might cut through. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, not if, but when that happens, you have to be prepared. You have to have already collected the tools or assembled the tribe or put a firm footing in your faith or whatever it is so that you don't take that to your person. Mm -hmm. You attribute it to the profession, to the MO for how this goes, but it can, it can slice. And those are usually the turning points. When you hear it enough, you have to decide whether or not it's worth it to keep going. How much do you love this? How much do you want this? How much can you invest in this logically in your life and still survive? And so the yeses come, they will come, but you have mm -hmm. to get to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that that's a daily struggle. I mean, I'll say last week I had a bad week. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was submitting an audition and it just was not connecting for me. And I wanted it so badly. And mm -hmm. it just, it just, it was not the day. And an actor friend of mine, uh, actually, after that bad day, I talked to him about it. And he said, you know, the thing about performers is we don't allow ourselves to have a bad day. Everybody else mm -hmm. gets them and every other profession, you know, and then you, you go home, you, you wipe it off and then you, you go in the next day. But for some reason, artists feel like you can never have a bad day. And maybe mm -hmm. it's that whole idea of the show must go on that we've been that's been drilled into us from the very beginning. And so we feel like if at any point we are not absolutely at our best then we failed but that's not the truth but sometimes when you're in the dark that's hard to see so I think in general in terms of the career the biggest obstacle is just staying in the game you can't dance if you're not at the party and so you have to prepare your world your home base to support you when you feel like faltering or you feel like quitting or you feel like you are a failure because of that one mm -hmm. no, that one no. So I think, I think that's probably a general challenge just for the industry in general and, and as a whole. And that's for all artists, not just for actors. And then, yes, I have shared some other challenges that have, uh, that have impacted me um, as a person, as an artist. My mother's death was a, uh, and remains a huge one you know it's just it's a it's a pain that never actually goes away it you know sometimes it hides from you sometimes it's less but it's never gone so that's something that I had to recommit myself to to my place in the world when she passed and that that's professional that's personal but she sits on my shoulder and she's she's with me all the time and and every once in a while she's like girl if you don't get up <laughs> it's like all right man i'm getting up i'm doing it i'm doing it it's beautiful i know how you feel i know yeah so my podcast is it's called running is cheaper than therapy but it's based on movement from a holistic aspect i know movement is important to you because i remember on our 25th line <laughs> anniversary you're the only person who got up and did the bike ride with me <laughs> and, <laughs> so i know fitness is important to you what does movement or fitness mean as far as your mental health and your overall well-being? It's really important. Sometimes a good sweat <laughs> can, <laughs> can just cure things or at least put them in perspective so that they don't seem so big. I will jump on a treadmill in a second. I'm, I'm less likely to run outside nowadays. I used to do that, but, um, you know, I got tired of stopping the stoplights and corners. And I was, yeah, it's nice a trail. It's nice on the trail. Yeah. Also, if I run on the treadmill, then when I'm watching television, I can, um, and I'm, I'm multitasking and, and I can justify <laughs> just sitting, quote unquote, sitting still and watching television. I'm like, no, 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 I'm doing it while I'm working. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah, no, I'm a bit of a workout junkie. So cathartically, it's usually running. Um, okay. But I, you know, I bike. Do you have a Peloton? I bike like as in a bicycle. Okay, I'm I got you. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry it hurts. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not the one I've tried multiple times with multiple instructors. I, yeah, it's it's not my thing. But I will get on a real bike. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I heard for miles. And then I like sports. I'm not particularly good at them. I'm not horrible, but you know, no, I'm not going pro anytime soon. What sports do you do you do you like? Uh, I like to play now because we're not talking about it as a spect- spectator. So I like to uh, I like to play basketball. Okay. I I like tennis. I used to play soccer as a child, so I still have an affinity for soccer. I think those are probably the top three. Yeah. I think that's it. <laughs> so 2020 and 2021, has been a rough year with the pandemic and COVID and people have suffered a lot of loss, whether it be personal, from um, this emotional aspect or losing family members or a financial aspect. But you have mm-hmm. a beautiful story that came out of the pandemic. You were married yeah. and were in Essence Magazine. Tell me about how you met your husband and your wedding so we met at the opening night reception for a play in pasadena we were both in attendance and it was a crowded lobby full of people you know congratulating actors and uh, and mingling about and so uh malik my husband uh, was on his way to congratulate one of the actors who was in the play. And like I said, it was it was kind of crowded in there. So I was literally in his way, <laughs> just in his way. And uh, the story, as he tells it, is that he could have said, excuse me, I'm gone past, or he could have said hello. And he chose to say hello. And that sparked up a conversation. And that was that was the beginning. So we met in the summer of 2019 Mm -hmm. we were engaged by that december and uh and then married last year so we had been planning um an in-person wedding (laughs) like anybody else would Mm -hmm. and then the pandemic hit and uh it was not safe for our family to travel for people to convene and We talked about whether or not we wanted to postpone the ceremony until after this thing was over. Of course, we had no idea that it was going to be as big and as long as it has Mm -hmm. been. But ultimately, we decided that we didn't want to postpone the wedding. So we said, well, how are we going to do this? (laughs) And uh, we actually ended up getting married in our living room. And we had a real, we had, we'd had a very large guest list for the in-person ceremony, but when we decided to do it on Zoom, which is what we did, we said, well, we'll just invite immediate family and uh, the wedding party. And then next year we'll have this big reception with all the people that we wanted to invite. Now is next year. And I'm not really sure that's going to happen because we're still in the middle of this thing, but our ceremony was perfect. You wouldn't you wouldn't think so. You'd think, oh, it's 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 Zoom and how can you be connected? But somehow it was everything that it could have been. And it was in our home and it was in our living room and our closest family and friends were right there and they were up close because there is a camera, so they're not sitting mm-hmm. in the back of some hall trying to see a detail. Um and it was amazingly intimate. And so because we could not have a reception with friends and family, um, we did decide to have a photographer and her idea, Maya Darasaw, was to, instead of doing kind of your traditional wedding photos, Mm -hmm. to hop in the car after the ceremony and take pictures around the city of LA that spoke to our story. So for instance, our first date was at a bookstore. So Mm -hmm. we, uh, we took some shots inside a kind of famous bookstore here in LA. bookstore. Nice. Mm -hmm. So, um, or the fact that we're both artists. So we took pictures in front of the Disney concert hall or, you know, so we were able to tell our story in pictures and, you know, we, we love the experience. We are forever grateful to Maya for capturing our day in that way. So Maya posted some of the pictures on her Instagram and uh, someone from Essence saw the pictures and and really liked them and reached out to us and said, we're talking to couples who decided to to push through and get married during the pandemic and would like to feature you in the article. And so 
we said yes. Because one of the things that happened, one of the places that we went, we were headed to an amphitheater at a park, again, to talk about the whole idea of being performers. And we had intended to take some shots that spoke to the civil unrest of last year, that spoke mm-hmm. to um, the, the killings and, uh, and the turmoil that we were going through uh, as a society. So we had prepared masks to put on that said, I can't breathe, that we were going to choose a, to take in front of the George Floyd mural downtown. Okay. So we're in the park about to take the amphitheater pics. And we happen upon a protest and we're like, well, wait a second. You know, certainly we had planned this other shot, but there is a protest right now. So we ran to the car and got our masks and actually joined the protest. So we were in the protest in our wedding attire. We had just gotten Mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were marching with the protesters. And of course, we got a little bit of attention and people were like, wait a second, did you just get married? (laughs) Like Like, half an hour ago. Yeah. (laughs) They began to crowd around us and it became this really beautiful communal moment. And that was one of the pictures that Maya captured. And it was one of the things that got the attention of Essence as well, us with the protesters around us in our wedding gear. So it all just kind of came together. Um, it was a really special moment for us. It was nice. Uh, uh, I'll put a link to the Essence article so people can see the pictures and read the article. Please do. Please do. Please do. So how's married life? Married life is really nice. It is really nice. You know, you don't really have context until you're in it. I've been a, an independent woman for, <laughs> for a long time. And I have the appropriate amount of fear that, oh my gosh, this is going to be so different. And it is so different, but it's a great difference. And, and I think that, you know, cause our, our romance was, was pretty whirlwind <laughs> in terms of the time frame. Mm-hmm. And, but the lockdown kind of tested us in a way that I think uh, you don't normally get at the uh, in a courtship and then especially at the beginning of a marriage. Because there's one thing to to move in together and to begin sharing everything and it become mm-hmm. we instead of me, instead of I. But then to literally be in the same place, in the same space, pretty much 24-7 for a year. I mean, if that's not a testing ground, I don't know what is. And we're mm-hmm. doing uh, we're doing great. So, so I think we weren't too crazy in this, in this, uh, whirlwind romance. So how do you know he was the one? You know, I can't say how I knew. Mm -hmm. What I can say is I knew early. It just made sense Mm -hmm. in a way that I had never encountered before. And it, and it mutually made sense. Like we were, we were making plans two, three months in. We were talking about it like it was like it was just natural. Uh, so I don't know what the how is. Okay. I had I had heard people talk about you know when you know you know, and that sounded really great for like a rom com, but I didn't know how much it really worked for the real world. <laughs> you know, I was like, all right, then sure, when you know you know, whatever. Uh, but 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 when I knew, I knew. Any last minute words of advice for my listeners who are interested in acting, screenwriting, producing, or just any words of advice as far as life and overcoming obstacles? Because <laughs> it's rough out there sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a little hard right now. Oh, wow. Professionally, I would say if you have the luxury to pursue your passion do it yes because i know people who would love to act i know people who would love to write but their lives just aren't set up that way you know Mm -hmm. they don't it's not that they can't do it it's that they can't do it in the life that they have right now and that mm-hmm. might change, and I hope it does for everyone who mm-hmm. has this dream. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're not in that situation and this is something you really, really want, I think you owe it not only to yourself, I think you owe it to the people who want it and for whatever reason don't have the luxury of pursuing it. I think, I think you honor them by honoring your own passion. Uh, so I would say that on a, prefer- on a professional level. On a personal level, hang in there, y'all. There's a lot going on and 
a lot coming at most of us, if not all of us. And there, it can't stay this way. Mm -hmm. There has to be a shift. Nothing stays the same. The only constant is change. However you want to put it in a, you know, in a fortune cookie, but it's the truth. So it, so whatever it takes to hang in there, change is coming. Joy is coming. I remember looking at an interview with you and your husband and he was saying, I think the question was like, why do you keep doing this? You know, with hearing the nose and I mean, it's just, it's just a struggle of being a, an actor or actress. And he was like, I guess it's his job or his purpose. I probably can't put it into words like he did to bring the characters to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that was moving. I agree. <laughs> I'm biased, but I agree. <laughs> so where can people find you? Well, you can find me on Instagram and uh, Twitter under Ms. Kelsey Scott, MS Kelsey Scott. And I'm on Facebook somewhere. It's, it's not quite as official. If you're looking for information or if you're looking to reach out to me, um, then you can reach me via my website, which is KelseyScott.com. And if you're talking about professionally, like I said, I'm shooting Insecure right now. Uh, I am also shooting. Uh, <laughs> I'm also shooting the the reboot of Dynasty. So uh, so I'll be popping up on those screens pretty soon. Um, and I have a a couple of other uh, projects that I'm actually in the producer position that I'm working on. So look for my name in credits as well as in uh, on camera. Can you share those or no? Mm, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Any we'll any other roles that you can share other than <laughs> than insecure and dynasty that you're at liberty to share? Uh, that's what's next. That's what's next okay. right now. And there, are, uh, you know, there's always something brewing in the background. But uh, but you can definitely check me out on those projects soon. Well, thanks for taking time to talk to me and my. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a fun time. That wraps up this episode of Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you already haven't, please download Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast on Apple, Spotify, or however you listen to your favorite podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, or possible show topics, Please email Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, OLB, Omaha Love Brown. Again, that's Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, Omaha Love Brown at gmail.com. I also can be reached via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Handle We Life, We Love. OUI Life, OUI Love. Thank you, and please tune in again.